I was born in 1949 and so grew up in the 50s and the 60s in what was known as the Jim Crow South. What would you say would be the strongest value in your family? What was most important to them for their children? Well, certainly education. That was very important. But I think also making sure that we understood the importance of civic engagement, our role in our communities. Tell me a little bit about your early education. Well, the elementary schools, as were all of the institutions in the South, were segregated by race. In the early 60s, we started to integrate schools in North Carolina. And so I and a few others <clears throat> in the early 60s went to what was then called the all-white high school. Even as teenagers, those of us who were in that school were there because we felt we had a purpose and we had a need and that integration was right. We were among the first, you know, to be doing that and felt that it was really critical in terms of the well-being of that town and as it was happening all over the country, the well-being of the country. Give me a sense of what Connecticut felt like, looked like to you when you first came here. And you were on the cusp of women really going to the University of Connecticut Law School, so tell me about your experience at the law school. As an evening division student, I probably didn't experience as much as the, uh, the students who were there during the day and participated in some of the extracurricular activities because I was working mm -hmm. um, and going to school, and that was my life. But you also had fun. Did you marry? I married and had two wonderful children. When did you become a member of the Connecticut Bar? I graduated in 76. I was sworn in okay. as a member of the Bar in 76. And where were you working at that time? I was working at uh, the Hartford National Bank. When I finished law school, and this is just, you know, it was just fortuitous, I was at Hartford National Bank and Trust Company, which had used um, a private law firm pretty much as its general counsel mm -hmm. um, for most of its legal activities, but had a lawyer on staff who was the general counsel, but primarily serving as the liaison to the, to the major firm. When I finished law school, at that time, the bank had decided to form its own legal department and asked me to stay on board to be a part of that, which was an exciting on-the-ground opportunity. So I was part of the law department before there was a general counsel to the law department. Really? Yes, I had the opportunity, therefore, to work in all aspects of banking. Um, because they were, only, they were the, only the two of us for a period of time. And then we slowly grew. It was in those early days that I became a corporate officer at the holding company, which was also a great opportunity uh, and position for me to hold at that time. So let's look at that period of the balance between career and family. How did you handle all of that? <laughs> well, that's not all of that, because it would have been neat if it were just a balance between a marriage and work. I was balancing work, marriage, and community activities. And so, again, as soon as I finished the studying and finished the bar exam and so forth, I felt a need to get right out in the community and see how I could remain a contributor and how I could become fully engaged. So it was balancing the three. It was an exciting time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's talk about a few of those community activities during that period that were near and dear to your heart. Well, there were a number of things. First, one is involved in the community where one lives. And so I was in the Blue Hills neighborhood and heavily involved in the Blue Hills Civic Association. Uh, and that was on a volunteer basis, obviously. A lot of the you know, fir firmly established institutions in the community, I served on the board of directors of some of those. There was a, a group of us um, early on, Hawa, Hartford <laughs> Area Women Attorneys. And we would get together in an informal setting and just compare notes about the very thing that you're asking about, you know. How are we making this with our homes and our families and our work and the challenges that we're meeting? It was, just, it was a nice little networking group. I had a full plate, but mm -hmm. it was the right plate full for me. Mm -hmm. And it was a very exciting time. Anything else? What was going yeah, on? Yeah, we the were African just American beginning community. the Crawford Law Society, and there were, um, and, and all of the again because it was a small group, the the African American lawyers knew each other. In fact, I think probably all of the African American lawyers in the state at that time in the early 70s um, knew each other. Let's go back to your career because it's a very interesting career. I left the bank though in um, 1979. Uh, in the Grasso administration, I was appointed Deputy Banking Commissioner, which was a fantastic opportunity for me. I had not been appointed to anything political in Connecticut, um, and so this was all new. Ella Grasso was in, 
it was interested in appointing a person of color to this position. She said that, you know, that this was an important appointment for her. In fact, when I was on the delivery table with my son, there was an article in the paper that I, <laughs> that I was likely to get the appointment. Um, and so we had to put it off for six weeks so that I could, you know, <laughs> be home with the baby and wrap up the, the other job. Uh, but that turned out to be, and I was 29 years old, and so it was an exciting opportunity. Were there other um, women of color who were attorneys in the, at Hartford National Bank at that time? No. No. How about for the deputy commissioner position? Had there been other No, there had not. Color? There had been a woman. Uh, there had not been a woman of color in that position before. You moved from there? To, all right, now your children have grown up some and you've moved from uh, deputy commissioner to... Came back into banking, um, and, but in a more focused area, primarily mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm. uh, again, in the, law, in, the, in the law department, and actually remained at the bank for a total of 20 years, mm -hmm. um, and taking the old Hartford National Bank, uh, working obviously with the department and the, and, the, and the staff there, through a series of acquisitions and growth throughout the state and throughout the region and uh, ending my career there finally as general counsel uh, of the, um, um, it was Shawmut Bank at that time of Shawmut Bank, Connecticut. And then the next position that I had, and I have been blessed to have some, some great professional opportunities, was working again in state government as a regulator, but this time in the area of public utilities. So I was a public utilities commissioner for the state of Connecticut for a little more than eight years, which again was a very exciting um, opportunity, exposed me to um, a great deal of additional learning mm -hmm. in areas where I was not familiar, but also allowed me to draw on the legal training, um, especially you know statutes and regulations and how they impact the way business can occur. I was part of the regulated industry, obviously, when I was in mm -hmm. banking. And coming here as a regulator for public utilities, I became uh, the regulator. So what year was this, Linda? Around what year? That was um, 95, I think, through, that was just before I came to the, until I came to the Hartford Foundation oh, for Public so Giving. When were you um, hired at the Hartford Foundation? I came in as president of the Hartford Foundation, Foundation. for Public Giving in 2005. Even the, the current role that I have and I'm so pleased to, to have it because I feel that it pulls together both my, my personal passions and my professional passions mm -hmm. by being here at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. It puts us in a place, we as women and as leaders, where we can reach back. So even in this position, we've been around for 90 years. Every CEO, every leader of this foundation has been a man mm -hmm. until the time that I was appointed. Now, one says, well, does that make a difference that you have a woman? Do you do things differently? It makes a difference in that it sets a new role model. Mm -hmm. It tells other young people, young women, that this is an opportunity that now exists for you. Mm -hmm. And so when we do these things, when people say it is a first, well, somebody has to be first at everything. But the significance for me isn't so much being the first as opening the door so that others can enter.